Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The state of Libya, which is a country of significant strategic value in the south-central Mediterranean, continues to be torn between domestic forces supported by regional and global powers. The winning side of the ongoing conflict between the Western-based government of National Accord and the Eastern-based Libyan National Army will grant their respective allies control of major economic and energy benefits. To deepen our understanding of the issues at stake, we're joined from a location in central Israel by Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at Shalem College. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining our panel from another location in central Israel is Dr. Chai Koenian Rochak, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center as well as the JISS at Tel Aviv University. Welcome. Thank you very much. And here with me in the studio is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and I'd like to immediately dive into this topic. Mr. Oren, this is a, a topic of strategic value, not only for Libya, Europe, and uh, countries of close proximity, but also for Israel, for that matter. Give us a little bit of a broader understanding of what, what is going on with this uh, situation. So uh, we have talked about Libya uh, recently, and uh, uh, on several occasions, uh, we delved into the uh, correlation of forces between um, Fayez Saraj and Khalifa Haftar. But let's for a second focus on Vladimir Putin. Putin um, is a very shrewd businessman. He uh, looks at the uh, uh, bargain basement of the Middle East. He finds companies torn between the various owners, he knows whom to bet on, and thus he gets a controlling interest in such companies. Now, I'm talking about Syria, of course, when he got in uh, some uh, four and a half years ago, almost five years ago, uh, he managed to put his bets on Bashar Assad, and now he, for all practical purposes, has a base in Syria. And the same goes for Libya, where he is now trying to help Haftar, to give him not only mercenaries or proxies, but also probably fighter jets, be they uh, Russian or uh, bought by various entities from Russia and then supplied to Haftar, in return for which he is going to get air bases. And these air bases are crucial for Russia when it wants to get to Venezuela or other Latin American locations or to sub Saharan Africa. And uh, this goes back even to 1970, right after the Muammar Gaddafi revolution in Libya, uh, the Willis air base, which used to be the biggest American airbase in the world outside of the United States on the coast of uh, Libya not far from Tripoli was turned over to the Soviet Air Force and it served it uh, for a while. So uh, one should look at what is happening in Libya now not only through the lens of who is going to control Tripoli in addition to Benghazi but how it is going to, uh, to impact the uh, relationship between Russia and the rest of world powers. Indeed. Dr. Lehrman, I'd like to refer the next question to you specifically vis-a-vis -vis the uh, aspect of uh, uh, each uh, regional power or global power trying to support their respective uh, 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 allies on the ground in Libya, be it uh, Khalifa Haftar or uh, El Saraj uh, in Tripoli. Uh, the Europeans understand the strategic threat to the continent uh, when it comes to whatever will emerge the day after the one side or the other will be victorious. Uh, they have launched, based on uh, a UN Security Council resolution, an arms embargo by uh, basically uh, elevating or bolstering the mandate of the previous operation called SOFIA into a more... Uh, 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 meat-worthy, if you will, uh, operation called Irini. Nevertheless, it seems like they're not successful on this front. Uh, both Turkey has been supplying significant amounts of weapon, uh, weapons to uh, the Saraj government in Tripoli. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, Egypt, we have the United Arab Emirates, we have uh, different countries 
uh, going on and, and supporting Haftar and, and actually uh, making the explosive situation into a lot disastrous proportions from a, a military standpoint? Well, um, I would say, first of all, that the equations in Libya changed dramatically since November 19. And the this is the result of a pact, which includes two elements, signed between the Siraj government in Tripoli and uh, Erdogan's government in Ankara. Turkey has reached out across the Mediterranean. It was already involved in Libya for, since uh, 2014 in a proxy war with Egypt, but now it raised the stakes to a much higher degree doing two things. First, it committed to send troops and supplies uh, on a much larger scale to the GNA government, to the government of national accord, which of course uh, tells you that there is no accord. Um, and in, in Tripoli, in order to resist the uh, siege laid to Tripoli by the Haftar forces. And in return, it also uh, received or organized with Saraj an agreement on carving up the Eastern Mediterranean EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone, in a way which give Turkey the capacity to strangle Israel, Egypt, and Cyprus um, when they want to try and lay uh, connectivity, whether it's a, a, a power line or a, or a gas line, to Europe. This is a grand strategic bid for dominance mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean, specifically in the Eastern Mediterranean, through changing the balance of power in Libya. And, and the fact is that the Turkish intervention succeeded. They have beaten back the uh, LNA, the Libyan National Army of Haftar. And once they have taken uh, the GNA with Turkish help, uh, once they took the Al Watiya air base, this greatly reduced the effectiveness of Operation Irini because by now it is safe for the Turks to fly supplies to the GNA. They don't have to use the, the um, maritime routes, which are under European supervision. Indeed. But the very uh, creation of Irini tells us that the key players in Europe, particularly France, to some extent even Italy, which was many, for many years a friend of Turkey and a friend of Saraj, have come to understand the danger of the present Turkish game. So do Egypt and so does Russia. And uh, this brings me to you, doc uh, Dr. Konya Narochak. To what degree do you see Turkey, uh, uh, as it is significantly invested into this conflict, also for historical reasons, but obviously also for its uh, uh, economic uh, uh, interests, do you see now the Turks uh, bolstering their, their operations even further uh, and uh, looking into not only uh, deploying their, their uh, uh, Syrian militias, which they uh, 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 send from Syria into uh, Libya, but also really uh, applying military presence of the Turkish military proper in order to support the Tripoli government uh, uh, of national accord? Well, the, the answer to your question is definitely yes. Uh, Turkey under Erdogan already adopted a very neo-Ottomanist uh, foreign policy. And uh, thanks to this foreign policy nowadays, we are seeing that the Turkish armed forces is very much present in the old uh, regional, in the old regions where Ottoman Empire once uh, present. Uh, from Erdogan's perspective and for his uh, neo-Ottomanist uh, supporters, uh, Libya is not an ordinary target. Uh, we may remember how Turks lost uh, Libya during the 1911 uh, uh, and 12, uh, the Tripoli, the war of Tripoli, where even the founder of the Republic, uh, Mustafa Kemal, fought there. Uh, we all know that uh, that particular war is uh, taught in the Turkish schools today, and it is very much known in the Turkish, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very known in the Turkish uh, public memory. So, uh, 
President Erdogan is always insisting that Turkey is not going to be the same country of 1990s. Uh, with an with an uh, preemptive strikes with a uh, with a uh, with an aggressive foreign policy from time to time, which includes uh, some military interventions, some extraterritorial military in interventions, which we already have seen in Syria, sometimes in Iraq, and nowadays in Libya. Uh, let us not forget, prior to the uh, fall of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, the the Turkish subcontractors. Uh, they uh, they were very much present in Libya, and they had a very important uh, share uh, in country's uh, economy. And nowadays, uh, Mr. Erdogan is also insisting, and uh, that he, uh, and he also asks uh, Mr. Sarraj to provide the same uh, uh, the same circumstances for the Turkish companies, so that they can also penetrate once again into Libya. And in the aftermath of the civil war, uh, it's not a secret that uh, uh, Turkish uh, Turkish subcontractors uh, and Turkish construction firms will uh, invade uh, Libya. And let us not forget, uh, Mr. Erdogan's uh, most important financial support at home is also coming from these uh, these construction tycoons. Uh, let us not forget again uh, that Mr. Erdogan uh, became very much strong thanks to the financial support of these construction giants at home. And uh, if you're looking uh, to Turkey uh, in a decade, you, you're going to see that uh, there were already uh, lots of construction projects were erected. And uh, these people uh, uh, contributed to uh, to country's economy in an unprecedented way. Mr. Erdogan is uh, integrating them into many uh, governmental bids at home, like... Uh, most important example, of course, is the uh, the, the Grand Istanbul Airport, and uh, so uh, Mr. Erdogan did not use a country's treasury, but instead he used his relations mm -hmm. with these uh, construction giants, so that this, these construct construction giants will ha acquire future projects. Uh, so it will be a win-win situation. So uh, that's that's how I can uh, summarize it for you in a nutshell. Very good. Uh, Mr. Ogan, I'd like to go back to the Ru uh, Russian angle of things. Uh, if we zoom out a little bit, we, we can see that the main rivalry in the Middle East, for Turkey at least, is Egypt. Now, in recent years, there's been a bolstering of bilateral relations between Egypt and Russia. We see the Russians have entered, similar to what happened also in Turkey, but they've entered uh, very strongly into the energy market of uh, uh, Egypt, into different aspects of uh, the tourism industry and, and so on. To what degree do you see this uh, current conflict in Libya, which Egypt has been uh, trying to promote for many years within the international community to intervene on behalf of Haftar and, and battling the Islamist uh, Muslim Brotherhood elements within the Sarraj government, uh, do you see the Russians actually coming to the aid of Egypt for interest, not only for the purpose of establishing their aerial uh, uh, capacity and, and uh, new airfields in Libya, but also on bolstering their relations with Egypt proper? So for Egypt, um, it is not uh, uh, the same situation as it is for Turkey or for Russia or even for Israel. It's almost existential. Egypt uh, depends on its border with Libya um, not to be breached uh, uh, so often, much as it depends on what is happening in Sudan and in Ethiopia for its water uh, in the Nile. So for Egypt, this is a major national security uh, concern. Now, um, not only are there no permanent alliances, there are not even permanent interests, because the regime in either capital can change the interest. It's not Turkey and Egypt, it's Erdogan and Sisi. Uh, it's uh, the uh, AK party, the uh, Islamist party in power in Ankara, vis-a-vis -vis the anti-Muslim Brotherhood regime in Cairo, which sees Turkey, as well as Qatar, as the allies for their own rivals. Now, uh, years ago, decades ago, Libya was part of the logistical rear for Egypt. In the 1973 war, 
uh, the uh, uh, Libyan Air Force sent its Mirage fighters to help Egypt. And actually, this was one of the indicators Israel has been waiting for in order to alert its forces. Once these uh, fighters uh, were transferred from Libya to Egypt, this was a warning sign. By the way, the Israeli spy, the Israeli agent Ashraf Mawan, was in charge of the Libyan dossier for Sadat, and at one time there were talks about a merger between Egypt and Libya. One more point. Um, what we have seen in Iraq as well as in Libya is that uh, the lack of uh, a dictator uh, causes the country to fall apart. The Americans were very naive when they invaded Iraq. They believed that they can democratize the country, they can bring about free elections, and that the Iraqis will become Americans with kefias. Of course, this did not come to pass, and in Libya too, after Gaddafi, the country is falling apart, and authoritarian figures such as Erdogan and Putin know how to exploit it, while democracies cannot really fight there because their publics will not support it. Dr. Lerman, would you agree with that? Well, definitely Libya is a story of a Western failure. Um, Obama um, led from behind, as he says, he defined it, a coalition that intervened in 2011. But then, um, as happened elsewhere, the, um, the West left Libya to its own devices rather than ma managing the transition in a way which could theoretically have led to some stability. So since 2014, we are looking at a war. And as I said, this is a proxy war. And I want to turn attention, uh, as, uh, as uh, Amir did also, to the Egyptian role. Uh, for Sisi today, the idea of Cyrenaica, uh, Haftar's base in uh, eastern Libya, Benghazi, and all the, uh, extending all the way to the Egyptian border, coming under Turkish control, under Erdogan's control, given the profound hatred Given that uh, Erdogan has defined Sisi as a usurper of power, never recognized the legitimacy of the new Egyptian government, kept mourning for what happened to President Morsi, and seeks to destabilize the Egyptian regime, uh, this uh, would compel, uh, may, co may compel Egypt to cross the border in intervention. This will not be the first time, by the way, in 1978, uh, Sadat briefly invaded Libya in order to teach Gaddafi a lesson not to interfere with Egypt's peace efforts vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And now, uh, I, I would not, not be surprised, surprised if we find that the Egyptians feel obliged to put their forces in if it looks as if Haftar, who, whom, if I may say, uh, who, who is not exactly a military genius, he had, he had Tripoli at the grip of his forces and then failed to hold it, um, if he is beaten back in a way that endangers Egyptian interests, we could be looking at an even greater level of intervention, conflict, and uh, growing international involvement. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Konya Nawochak, to what degree are the Turks uh, influenced by the Egyptian role in the story? Mm -hmm. The fact, of course, that uh, the Ottoman Empire emerged after the defeat of the Mamluks in uh, 1517, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, ultimately, one thing after another, there's been always somewhat of a rivalry between Ankara and Cairo. Now, of course, the relations between uh, uh, President uh, uh, Erdogan and Abdel Fattah el-Sisi of uh, Egypt, uh, it seems like uh, they're really at uh, an all-time low and, and may even uh, turn into uh, worse uh, capacities on the military front uh, within Libya proper. Well, uh, Turkey always looks to Egypt, you know, from above, because Egypt once upon a time was a, was a Turkish province. First, let's, uh, first, let's start from that. And uh, the, Libya, the Libya war, from Turkey's point of view, the, the first objective is breaking the geographical contiguity of the, 
uh, exclusive economic zones of Greece, Republic, so Republic of Cyprus and Israel. And then Egypt is also uh, becoming a, a part of the picture. So uh, uh, the, the main Turkish attention is at the uh, Eastern Mediterranean to foil this uh, East Med pipeline. And then, uh, and then, of course, uh, if uh, the Turkish success uh, in the uh, in Libya can be translated into another uh, threat against Adel Fetah al Sisi, which will be wonderful for Mr. Erdogan, uh, but uh, you know this is this is another level. So uh, nowadays we are uh, marching towards this level. And uh, uh, as you can see from the uh, war uh, map, maps of war, uh, the Turkish uh, the Turkish backed forces are marching towards Sirte and towards the east. So, uh, from my perspective, it will be inevitable for uh, Egypt and maybe also the United Arab Emirates, which is uh, widely accused by the Turkish press that it is the number one responsible of this whole bloodshed uh, in uh, in Libya. Uh, so, from my perspective, uh, I, I guess there will be a confrontation between uh, all of these countries. But again, as uh, Professor Lerman already stressed, that it will be a proxy war again. I don't think uh, I don't think that we're gonna see uh, we're gonna see a, a, you know an end uh, in bilateral relations of the countries. Indeed, uh, Mr. Ogan, I'd like to bring Europe into the the picture more uh, uh, to the forefront. Uh, the situation between Turkey and Greece has been very dire. It's uh, obviously the EEZ agreement between Libya and, and Turkey uh, was made at the expense uh, primarily of uh, Greece and uh, Cyprus, who both have claims for those territories in question. Uh, now, the Irini operation that uh, was uh, supposed to uh, thwart the smuggling of weapons into Libya was headed by uh, the commander of the Hellenic Navy, uh, who uh, ultimately was uh, relinquished of his uh, duty uh, in favor of the Italian uh, naval commander. Is there a signal from Europe towards Turkey and uh, its ally in Tripoli with regard to the shifts of command, or is this just coincidence predetermined uh, already? Well, Italy is even closer to Libya, and uh, its national security interest uh, is intertwined with what is happening in Libya as well as in Malta, uh, because uh, you have talked about uh, the import of weapons into Libya, but there is also the export of migrants, not necessarily from Libya itself, but through Libya, uh, African um, migrants coming from sub-Saharan Africa looking for work in Europe go through Libya and try to get into Italy and other European countries. So this is one reason for the concern in Italy and um, in other uh, uh, places. Now, uh, we are talking about it from an Israeli perspective too. The problem is, for Israel, it's peripheral to the core, to the Middle Eastern core. And um, uh, Eran Lerman was a senior official in government when um, Israel was surprised by what the British and others told Israel regarding the Libyan nuclear project not so long ago, which means that with the limited resources that Israel can invest in whatever is happening around it, Israel neglected Libya to some extent. So what we are uh, now saying uh, has to be um, at least limited. One must always remember this caveat. Indeed. Dr. Lerman, would you like to comment? Well, certainly uh, this is a famous story, and I think... Uh, our current Minister of Energy knows the story very well because at the time he was the, uh, at the um, Knesset committee that investigated the failure of our intelligence services to fully appreciate what was going on in Libya. So it's a, it's a well-known uh, example. Uh, I was no, actually, I was not in government. I've left government for American Jewish Committee for a while, but uh, I, I was still very much following uh, the third turn of events. Libya uh, is much more important to us than most Israelis realize because it has by now become the linchpin of the fight between Egypt and Turkey for dominance in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is a fight very much in our interest. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just Israel's interest. In the next few weeks, we shall see in Israel, uh, hopefully, 
visits by uh, the leaders of Greece uh, and Cyprus uh, after the long uh, hiatus uh, caused by the coronavirus. Um, Israel, Greece and Cyprus are fully united on this issue. And the European position, um, in t at least in terms of the diplomatic reaction to this EEZ map project between Siraj and Erdogan, the European position was unified and quite aggressive, uh, relatively speaking. They demanded to see the map and they made it very clear that anything that contradicts the uh, legitimacy of uh, Greek the Greek EEZ surrounding uh, Crete, which stands directly in the way of the, the Turkish um, outline, uh, any, any attempt to ignore it uh, runs against the law of the sea as we know it and against European interests. And here Italy, which for many years tried to befriend uh, Turkey and was definitely trying to keep an open mind towards Siraj, uh, has been, uh, has found itself in a dilemma. Unfortunately, of course, uh, all European countries, Italy above all perhaps, have been distracted uh, thoroughly by the corona crisis, Indeed. but ultimately they will have to focus their attentions on Turkish ambitions. This is the name of the game. Indeed. Well, uh, unfortunately, we do not have uh, enough time for an analysis from each and every one of you. So, uh, Mr. Olin, just a closing sentence from you. In the 1990s, Israel uh, and the Palestinians, but then also Jordan, started the Oslo process uh, with various uh, iterations. And uh, this brought about also a European and NATO uh, initiative vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Africa. The Barcelona process and the Mediterranean dialogue of the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization. Libya was not part of it at the time, but it was considered a hopeful candidate. Again, hopefully, one day when it all settles down, we'll go back to these initiatives. With much hope and prayer, but this is all the time that we have for today. And I'd like to thank Dr. Eran Lehrman, as well as Dr. Chaitan Konya Narochak, and with me, of course, here, Mr. Amir Oren. Thank and you. I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.